Happy Friday, everyone. On today's show, the Colorado Avalanche take a commanding series lead, plus the Tampa Bay Lightning look to come back in their conference final action. We've got a look at the NHL award so far and more all on today's Locked On NHL. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Friday edition of Locked On NHL. I am Rachel Donner from Locked On Flyers. I'm on Twitter at rmiriam. I'm here, as always, on Fridays with Gil Martin of Locked On Isles. You can find him on Twitter at IceWarsNYRVSNYI. Thanks for making Locked On NHL your first listen every day. We are free and available on all of your favorite podcasting platforms. Plus, you can watch us over on YouTube. How are we doing today, Gil? I am great. How are you? I'm good. I had a lot of fun watching last night's game two between the Colorado Avalanche and Edmonton Oilers. Let's get into that one. The Avalanche are now up two to nothing, winning both games at home so far in the conference final series. And man, I got to say, I love watching this Avalanche team. They play with such confidence. And their puck possession in last night's game in particular was outstanding. Yeah, they really, they control the puck. And when you control the puck, you control the game. And they did a very, very good job of it. They were, you never really got the feeling, even though, you know, the goals came very close together. You never got the feeling that that Edmonton was going to get back into that game because Colorado just controlled it and, Always great when your backup goaltender comes up with a shutout. Exactly. Uh, Yeah, the the Avs spent a lot of time in the offensive zone during the game. And I think that while you you want to give them credit, but also the Oilers, I think, made a bunch of mistakes and some sloppy play missed passes. It it didn't feel like they've been at their best at all in both of these games so far. Yeah, their A game didn't show up, and they have to bank on that returning when they get back home because, look, they have to win one game in Colorado to win this series, minimum of one game. But they need to regroup. They need to get their game back because we just aren't seeing it so far in the two games of this series. Yeah, we are not. Uh, You mentioned the backup goaltender for the Avs, Pavel Franco's pitched a shutout in that game last night of course in for Darcy Kemper who's out with an upper body injury and I think that he played a tremendous game I will say that he made me a little nervous he's a guy that tends to go out of the net a lot (laughs) he is a wanderer yes (laughs) but it's his birthday today by the way so happy birthday well there's timing you see that (laughs) there there is timing and Look, you know, it's a tough job being a backup goalie in the playoffs when you you realize you're only going to play if the starter gets hurt or really has a bad game. And, you know, when, when you're in that position, you may not play for a week, 10 days, and to come, on, come back in and, and be counted on in a big game like that, he really stepped up, and, and that's exactly what you want from your backup goaltender in the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it did not hurt that the Avs were playing well defensively in the game. And I think we're able to kind of get behind it and have a lot of puck support. But still, it, it was a really great performance in that with uh, 24 saves in the game for him. Uh, I also want to talk about the goaltending on the other side, Mike yeah. Smith, in that he got pulled from game one in that mess of a game. <laughs> yeah. 14 goals in in that game. But, you know, they put him back in in game two. And I think that he actually looked pretty good, especially in the first period uh, of that game. And until those three goals in a little over two minutes, I thought he was keeping the Oilers in it. Yeah, look, he faced 40 shots, made 36 saves, and he did keep them in it probably longer than they deserved to be. 
But eventually, when you're dealing with a very fast, very skilled, talented team like the Avs, you keep giving them that many chances, one or more of them is going in. Yeah, and especially I think with Mike Smith, you're going to have this expectation of at least one soft goal yeah, in a game yeah. from him. And, you know, I would not blame this game on him at all. And we're going to talk about some of that uh, in a little bit. But I do think that maybe a different goaltender would have saved at least one of them. That was like one of the two on ones or something. Right. But um, I do, I don't want to put all of this on Mike Smith. And, you know, we talked about the shots on goal in this game, 40 to 24 in favor of the abs, which is uh, a little bit concerning, I would say for the Edmonton Oilers, especially because they only had six shots on goal in the second period and five in the third. And when you're coming, trying to come back, from being down, you know, three to nothing, that is not going to get you anywhere. No, it, it is not. And, you know, so many people are always ready to talk about the Avalanche's skilled offensive players, your Landis Goggs, your McKinnons, your Cadres. Give some credit to this defense and this defensive unit in that they took an explosive Edmonton Oilers team and really shut them down and limited the number of opportunities they had when they're facing, you know, when they're playing with their backup goalie, no less. So the Avs knew the kind of game they had to play and they executed it well. They did. And I think, you know, they got some really good contributions across the board. Like you said, on the defensive side of things, on the offensive side of things, Nazem Kadri had three assists on those mm -hmm. quick goals in the second. It was really good to see Rantanen on the board as well. With the last of those three quick goals, uh, he had not been scoring as much in the playoffs as he did in the regular season. Just to see him contribute, I think, was really good for the Avalanche. Uh, going back to the Oilers, I think there was one issue that concerned me, especially going back home. And I don't know if it was frustration or what with being down three goals at that point. But they took a lot of penalties, mm -hmm. especially in the latter half of the game, including a too many men on the ice call. Um, and then there was that bench interference call on Zach Cassian. I mean, yeah. he baited Byram into a, a penalty himself. But still, it's not great. Like, I, I really think the Oilers need to get more disciplined if they're going to get back into it. Evander Kane had two roughing calls. I mean, that was just frustration, right? There. Yeah. They, can, they can't play like that. No, you, you can't play like that if you want to have any hopes of getting back into the game last night and getting back into the series in general. And look, I understand the frustration level. Here is a, an explosive offensive team getting bottled up and not, you know, 24 shots on goal. I, I mean, the Oilers can get that in a period if they're on their A game. So uh, I understand the frustration, but, you know, you don't advance to the Stanley Cup finals and you don't beat – a talented deep team like the Colorado Avalanche without playing disciplined hockey. And that is something that the Oilers need to work on. Being at home may help a little bit, but I, I get the feeling it'll be important for Edmonton to get off to a fast start in game three. I think so. And I think that the stars of that team need to step up and, and set that example. I mean, even McDavid himself said he was not playing at his best and, Hopefully he'll be able to on home ice, but I do think those are the two keys to the game for them moving forward in the series when they're at home is play better disciplined hockey with crisper passes, don't get caught in the penalty box all the time, and the stars have to kind of put up or shut up on the team. Yeah, they have to step up. You know, your best players have to be your best players, and, uh, you know, the and again, I don't want to single anyone out, but Darnell Nurse minus three. He was on the ice for a lot Yikes. of those goals. <laughs> yeah, you know, and he's a darn good player. I, I am a big fan of his, but uh, last night was not his best night. It was not. Yeah, you could definitely, you hear the uh, commentary on the game. It was like, oh, Darnell Nurse makes another mistake. <laughs> and you're yeah. just like, oh, man, guy's not having a good night. All right. Well, there's another series going on over in the East between the New York Rangers and Tampa Bay Lightning. We are going to talk about that part of the playoffs coming up next. But first, we're going to talk about Bet Online. 
Yeah, betonline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup, the NHL Hockey Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, and of course, all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. So we have an important favor to ask of you out there. Uh, Locked On has put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite Locked On podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and what you don't like about our podcast. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It won't take very long, and everyone that completes the survey qualifies for a chance to win one of $1,000 Ticketmaster gift cards. That's pretty cool. So to take that survey, once again, go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey, and thanks for all your help. All right, the New York Rangers versus the Tampa Bay Lightning. I think in somewhat of a surprise to many, a game one, of course, the Rangers won six to two in convincing fashion. And I, I think that the Lightning obviously had been well rested and you could say maybe they were rusty. Gil, what is your take on the whole getting too much time off in the playoffs? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, it, it, it can, if you're an athlete, it, it can destroy your momentum, your rhythm, your concentration, but it also helps rest those injuries and those nagging, you know, lingering pieces of pain that every NHL player after playing at this point roughly 100 games this year uh, is going through. I don't think the Lightning you know, played terribly. They did have 39 shots on goal, but they were clearly outplayed by the New York Rangers. And the thing I don't like about the too much rest thing is that the exact same team does the exact same thing. If they win the game, they were well rested. If they lose the game, they had too much time off. I want to know before the fact, not after the fact that this is a factor. So, uh, you know, that's just sort of an old standby by the media. Uh, but there is truth to it. I, I'm not going to deny that either. So, look, Tampa Bay needs to to sort of gather themselves. They realize now that they're in this series and they have to respond being down one nothing. And, look, here's a team that's coming off back-to-back cup wins. They know what it takes to get the job done in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They do. And I think that it would behoove them – to and they're doing this don't get me wrong but in terms of looking at the specifics of what went wrong in that first game I think you know they made a lot of turnovers yeah and the Rangers were able to capitalize on on several occasions in that game and I think if they just clean up the little things they'll be in much better shape and I think it's a big challenge for them because the Rangers built a lot of confidence in game one, especially at home, game two at home again. The Rangers have been, I think, outperforming themselves even at home (laughs) in these playoffs. And there is something to that Madison Square Garden crowd and that energy. I know like we both live here in New York, so we have experienced it quite a bit. And it is a very special venue and there's something about it with those Rangers teams. So the Lightning are going to have to work really hard to get back into it. One thing that I think will be super helpful for them in that process is Andre Vasilevsky. And he just does not lose two games in a row in the playoffs very often. I mean, almost never. And the goaltending matchup between Vasilevsky and Shesterkin is worth the price of admission in this series. And Vasilevsky wasn't on his A game in game one. Shesterkin was fantastic. And, you know, the Rangers have gotten to the conference final with inconsistent play from Shesterkin so far. If he starts putting together a few games in a row that are really, really outstanding, the Rangers could take a quick early lead in the series. On the other side, 
the the bolts need more from Vasilevsky in game two, but like you said, he rarely has two bad games in a row. No, and I did read somewhere that he was, you know, taking some extra practice time on the ice and working on some things. And that's just the kind of guy he is. And yeah. there are high expectations from him, but it's for good reason that he's a guy that delivers, especially in the playoffs. And so I don't have any doubt that he'll be on his A game in game two against the Rangers. Uh, what I do wonder is if the Rangers are going to be at that level that they were in, in game one. So what do you think the Rangers have to do to keep winning against this tough opponent in Tampa? Well, obviously they need a lot from Shesterkin. There's no question about that. And then I, I think one of the keys is going to be getting some secondary scoring. I mean, your, your Panarins, Zabinijads, Criders, those guys, that's who Tampa Bay is going to try to concentrate on shutting down and they're going to need, you know, they got two goals in game one from Philip Cheadle. They're going to need some of yeah. those secondary guys, the Vetranos, the Lafreniere's, the Cheadles. So they're not going to need maybe one or two goals a game from, from those secondary guys, but they're going to need them. Yeah, Hedl's one of those guys that I love watching play because he does come up big at opportune moments. I know I always joke on the Flyers show about when the Flyers play the Rangers that he is guaranteed to score against them because he's just kind of sneaky in that way. And, and I think you're right that if they're going to kind of force Tampa to spread out their top defensive pairings a little bit more, if they can get some more secondary scoring, that will help them a lot in this game. I, I also think that they just have to continue that fast pace of play yep. that worked so well in game one. I think that kind of matches them skater for skater with the Lightning in a way that the Lightning maybe aren't as, as used to uh, in their regular competition. They're used to being the faster, more intense team out there on the ice. And when the Rangers can match that, it kind of puts the lightning on their heels a little bit. It does. It sort of takes them out of their rhythm. And all, all of a sudden, you, you know, it's like you're not the biggest guy in the room anymore. And how does that change the way you go about things when you're used to being the biggest guy in the room? So, yeah, it, it is a challenge. But, again, you got to figure that Tampa Bay, they've been there. They've done that. They'll know how to make some adjustments. I think we'll see a better performance in game two from the lightning. I think so, too. I mean, if you recall, they got shut out pretty badly versus the Leafs in game one of that series. They came back in the next game to win five to three. So we know that they absolutely can do it. Uh, it's just a matter if the Rangers once again will match them at home or if the Lightning are like, all right, this is our series. This is our cup. We know how to do this. Let's go ahead and win it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I am very excited for the rest of this series just because I think with the Rangers being such an unexpected pleasure to watch, honestly, in, in the playoffs. And once again, I hate saying these things as a <laughs> Flyers fan, but my God, have they been entertaining and, you know, playing with house money like we've been saying. And so to for them to go up against the two time defending champions, it feels like a even though they have the top goaltender in the league ostensibly, they feel like a scrappy underdog at the same time. And I feel like that's what makes this series so fun. It, it does. And, you know, look, you, you you say that maybe these are not the four best teams in hockey, even though you could say they are. Uh, but these four remaining teams are all entertaining. They play a fun style of hockey to watch. And that just adds to the to the conference finals and the Stanley Cup playoffs. It really does. I cannot wait for game two tonight in this series, and uh, it should be a lot of fun over this weekend and over the next week or week and a half or so. Hopefully we'll get a game seven between one of these two series because I want to keep it going a little bit. Longer. Absolutely. Uh, we've got some NHL awards to talk about coming up next and look at the calendar for the NHL awards for this season. And we will do that right up next. 
All right, Gil, the NHL awards so far, they've been doing this in an interesting fashion where they've been announcing one award a day. Uh, So far, we have the Marc Messier Leadership Award went to Anze Kopitar from the LA Kings. It's definitely a made-up award for no other reason than to have Marc Messier have something to do, I guess. But at least he's on the broadcast now, so it (laughs) sort of makes sense. We get to see Mess a little more often, so yeah, there, there, there is that. Uh, Look, they're all made-up awards, right? Well, yeah, the league makes them up, but. But uh, I like the idea of, of the Marc Messier Leadership Award. And Kopitar, you know, nobody expected the Kings to do anything close to making the playoffs this year. They did. And, you know, one thing, and we've talked about this on the show over the season, they have a nice mix of, of younger players and veterans. But Kopitar, definitely uh, the leader of that team. And, uh, you know, I think he was deserving of the Messier Award. Absolutely. Yeah, he is such a big part of that team, but off the ice as well. He does a lot with the youth hockey programs in Southern California and, of course, in his native country of Slovenia, which is underrepresented in the NHL. I think he takes that very seriously and wants to represent well and bring as much as he can back home. And and he does that. So definitely a well-deserved award. No question. Uh, The bigger award we got last night, Daryl Sutter of the Calgary Flames wins the Jack Adams Award for Best Coach. Yeah, and and again, the Flames, you know, winning their division and, and, you know, a little disappointed, I guess, in their playoff run. But uh, overall, a very good season there. And, you know, the the Jack Adams Award is sort of a, a tough one because they always give it to the coach who did something unexpected, who turned a team around. That tends to be who wins it. And then there is that jinx associated with it, where Mm -hmm. usually in a couple of years after you win that award, you're out of a job. So uh, I don't necessarily think that'll happen in this case, but, uh, you know, winning it is a little, a little iffy because of the, the, the aftermath is not always pretty. Yeah, and I think that, you know, you talk about in sports all the time that to create a successful team, you have to have a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think Sutter really does that with the teams that he coaches, that uh, the Flames are a very good team, don't get me wrong. But I think that if you look at the individual pieces, I mean, obviously, other than Markstrom, who put together a tremendous season in net. Yes. for them. And and there's always correlation between the Jack Adams and having a top goaltender. But <laughs> I think at the same time if you look at, you know, some of the depth on that team, he really knows how to put the right combinations of players together and really make them like I said, just the whole of the Calgary Flames was better than the sum of its parts, I thought. Yeah, Daryl Sutter just knows how to maximize the talent mm-hmm. of his team. He is an established winner as a coach, and it, it was great to see him get recognized and, and win that award. And, you know, not that there weren't other deserving candidates out there, but I can't argue with this decision. Not at all. Uh, today we will learn the winner of the Masterton Award. And uh, don't like to talk about this in a competitive fashion because – uh, you know, there's some hardships that the nominees have gone through to get there. And so any one of them winning this award would be well deserved. Uh, the finalists are Zidane Chara, Kevin Hayes and Carrie Price. Yeah, I, I, I think Price is probably <clears throat> the favorite to win it. But any one of these three would be very deserving. I think so as well. And um it's just always so heartbreaking to think about, you know, what some of the, even like the nominees that aren't finalists yep. in terms of what they may have gone through, whether it's, you know, an injury or a personal situation um, or just, you know, persevering and longevity in, in your career. I think that um, they're all uh, great aspects of the NHL. So they're all winners here. <laughs> um We have more awards uh, being handed out on a daily basis over the next four days. So on Saturday, we've got the Willie O'Ree Community Hero Award. On Sunday, we've got the Selkie Trophy. Very interested to see who wins it this year. 
Um, and then following that, we have the Lady Bing trophy and then the King Clancy. We skip to June 21st before we get the big awards. So the Calder, the Hart, the Norris, the Ted Lindsay, and the Vezina will be then. And so um, we get, you know, a little bit of a break there, but a lot of awards to be announced over the next few days. Yeah, and that's, that's always fun. You always want to see who gets these awards. And, and it, these are honors for the players. And it, it's interesting because a lot of the time they sort of take it for granted when it happens. And then after they retired, it becomes the significance of it sort of grows on them, I think. I think so too, you know, especially uh, with something like the Selkie trophy and the Norris as well. Um, I, my personal opinion is that we should you know, de-emphasize scoring a little bit in the Norris trophy award voting. Um, and I think we should really look at the Selkie in the same way and that really have it look at two-way play. Well, the alternative is to have sort of a defensive defenseman award, which I yeah. think would, would be a good thing because, you know, the offensive defensemen, they're flashy, they're, they're exciting. They're, they're always going to get the majority of the attention. And it's almost sort of like comparing apples to oranges. But if, you, if, you, if you're going to have a Selkie award for the best defensive forward, you should have an award for the best stay-at-home defenseman or best defensive defenseman. I, I think that's something that is overdue to get recognition. I think so, too. It, it kind of puts a divide there. Although it, the way the league is changing, defensemen, I think, overall are expected to be more involved in the offensive side of play. I personally am a an advocate of getting rid of positions for skaters in hockey. I think they should just be skaters and you adjust to the situation at hand. <laughs> um, I, I love five forward power plays because throw caution to the wind and that is my style and I, th I think it's the future of the game but there is something to be said for a stay-at-home defenseman and if that's one of the roles you want to have let's honor that appropriately agreed all right well like we said we've got game two of rangers lightning tonight game three for that series will be sunday we've got game three of abs oilers tomorrow so lots of fun hockey this weekend uh, thank you so much for listening to locked on nhl today and this week gil uh, what you got going on on your monday show we will have uh three of our local experts discussing the conference finals so uh looking forward to that and it's just been such exciting hockey it's been a great ride and i know it's going to continue so uh should be a great weekend and we'll we'll have it fully covered for you and the two of us will both be back next friday to recap the week that was in the nhl once again i am rachel donner you can find me on twitter at our miriam gill here is on twitter at ice wars N Y R V S N Y I. Have a great weekend, everyone.